looking to this leadership of uh, Joshua at this time, and we apply it to the leadership of the church, even our own church. How we carry things out, uh, how instructions are obeyed. There are still a lot of lessons we need to learn as leaders. So let's pray that as we explore the leadership aspect, not so much about the story, but the leadership aspect. Let's pray that the Lord will give us wisdom. So that we also, even as our pastor led us, earlier in prayer rightly said, three very important things. The willingness to obey God. The willingness to understand what God is saying. And then the desire to quickly do it and not just hear. One thing is to understand, one thing is to believe, another thing is for you to do it. So for us leaders, there's a great lesson for us in this book of Joshua chapter 2. So let's pray the Lord will help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Father, we once again come before you uh, this evening. Thank you for a teacher you have used to teach us. Now that we want to explore the, some concepts in this passage of Scripture, we believe that your Holy Spirit will lead and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've read through Joshua chapter 2, verse 1 to 24, so I'm not going to repeat it because we really won't have time to do that. But... The basis of my talking to us tonight as leaders, I want to use uh, this passage that we just read in Joshua chapter 2 to kind of uh, encourage us in uh, our leadership. I'm sure as workers in the church and as leaders, as pastors, we may be thinking, well, you know, this story is just a story of Rahab only, but it goes beyond Rahab. Number one, here we see the issue of continuity. That's one of the most important things you first see here. Number one, as our brother rightly, our pastor who taught us rightly said, if you go back to the book of Numbers, you will discover there Numbers 13 and all the rest of them, how Moses, by the instruction of the law, sent uh, to a spy out. And we now see that Joshua took over from him, also sent spies out. In the case of Moses, he sent out 12. In the case of Joshua, he sent out only two men. So the question is, why the change of pattern? And why the change of method? Initially it was 12, now we only have two. So that's a good question to ask. Because right from the beginning of that chapter 2, he says, And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an Halos house named Reha and lodged there. In fact, just that one verse alone, you can be there for the rest of today, just analyzing it. Number one, Joshua here was a good choice. Joshua's action here validated the choice of Moses, the, the fact that Moses chose him. Of course, we understand, we've, we've learned so much about Joshua. We've learned the first time we saw Joshua in Exodus 17, we've learned about how he came in, how he became Moses' minister, his dedication, how he stood with, you know, at one time he was even jealous about the leadership of uh, Moses to the point that when he saw the spirit of God that was upon him coming upon another, he said, especially those who are not in the camp with them, he said, stop them, my, uh, my Lord, stop them, don't let the spirit go to them. So he was a man that was totally consumed and dedicated. 
to God's leadership of his people. One thing we have to realize is when God makes a choice of a man to lead his people, God expects that everyone that he puts under that man must work with him. And if you see any, anywhere in scripture where people rise against a leader that God chose, you are going to discover that those people never find it easy. Let's take Moses for an example. All those that rose against Moses because of his own peculiar challenges, you know, he married an, uh, an Ethiopian woman, he did this, he did that, you know, all those concerns that people had. God was never on the side of those individuals. Do you know why? Because God knew about all those challenges before he put it there. Amen? So the problem is not about the man's challenge. The problem is that God says, go and do it, and God is able to help him to do the work that he has given unto him. And God is not expecting that people are going to look at Moses and say, well, because of this challenge, because of that challenge, because of this and because of that thing, you can't leave. You know, as Miriam and uh, his brother uh, Aaron, as they did, and then as uh, Dathan, Korah, and Abira, they did, all through the time of Moses, you are going to discover that God never backed them up. Why? Because when God has made a choice, he has made a choice. And whatever defect is there, God is able to fix it. And also when God is transitioning, which is what we are learning now, the second lesson, when God is transitioning from a former leader to a new leader, God, God, is, God always takes his time. And as you look at the life of Joshua now, you can see that there very clearly his choice was great. Of course, we learned that in verse 1, uh, in chapter 1, that it was actually God who came to him and asked him to arise and lead the people. So it was not just him running to say, I want to lead. But then, the moment God now gave him an affirmation to move on, look at the very first decisions he started taking. He started taking decisions in accordance to what, what the former leader are taking. God already said, you are going to go to the promised land. The people are going to go there. If they didn't get there in the time of Moses, it wasn't because I couldn't get them there. It was because they didn't obey me. But now you rise up, you lead the people, and everywhere the sole of your feet will touch, I have given it unto you. And so, he went ahead and he obeyed God. So, here we see now that his obedience was now uh, complemented with action. So he sent out spies, two spies, instead of twelve that was sent. The lesson we learn in terms of the number twelve and two is basically there are several lessons you can learn, but one of them is the crowd is always very difficult to control. Amen. The crowd is always too difficult to control. The fewer the people the easier it is, especially in leadership. Especially in leadership. And that's why, even though, think about it this way, even though Jesus had the twelve, right? How many of them do you always live here? Three. Just three, just the first three. It's always the first three. Why? Because, you know, you have to have some people that you can say, go! And they won't, they won't be saying, where are we going? Uh, so, if we go now, what do we do? You know, because before you say go, they already have your mind. They already understand your goal. They are in counsel with you. They understand, you know, because Joshua had been in counsel with Moses. And so, he understood the mind of God. And he had no reason to be doubting that this is what God wants to do. Even though the people doubted, yet, he was able to work with him. And he never had any opportunity. And I'm sure with... with uh, Joshua being so close to Moses, will he have seen some weaknesses in Moses? Absolutely. When you are very close to people, you see a lot of things that others don't see. You know, sometimes uh, I always say that some of us, when we were just members of the church, maybe it was much easier for us. And I'm talking about myself now, not you. Because sometimes when you get close to a leader, if care is not taken, it can actually destroy your faith. Because if you are not strong enough, you will not be seeing the divinity in that person. You will be seeing, you will only be considering the humanity. And we are all human. Amen? Moses was human. But Joshua walked with him. And the, the, what we learn here is that all through the time, you never saw a time when Joshua uh, ever looked down 
on Moses. He just followed him. He just obeyed him. Whatever he said, he did. So uh, it's a good lesson for us as leaders to learn. And I'm going to be talking to Roy about some principles today, but I just decided I'm going to talk about this uh, before I get there. Some principles of growth. That you have to understand that for an organization to grow, for example, put it this way. If you have a place like Walmart, right? And uh, I've said this before, and a place like a small stock, there's a difference between those two things, right? If you want to have a place that looks like Walmart, you better be ready to delegate. You better be ready to transition to people so that we can handle different things and do different things. But if you want to remain just in small stock, you will remain there forever. If you want to do everything by yourself, you're going to remain there forever. And so, if you are thinking growth, and if we are thinking growth, we have to start doing things differently. We cannot keep doing things in the, like uh, somebody who is running a small store, and then we expect that we're going to grow to become a big stop. It does not work that way. You have to involve others, and you have to be able to trust them. But now the question is, what's the process of trusting? That's what we are talking about. That Moses trusted Joshua to the point that God will appoint Joshua uh, to take over from him. And now Joshua was following the same blueprint that God had given to Moses. Everything that he did was almost according to what Moses Gave him. In fact, when you get to the end of the life of Joshua, you're going to find out that he did everything according to how God commanded Moses. That's the what you're going to find. So in that verse 1, he says, Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men out of shitting to spy secretly. So it was very easy. And this time, he doesn't have to now screen 12 people. All he needed was just two people that he can trust. Just two. And that's very, that's so easy for him. Because when, when Joshua, uh, when Moses was looking for the two, he actually just called the tribes and they gave him one man. Right? So, 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 from the tribe of so, 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 so. But here now we are not told that they are from what tribe, right? We are just told he, he shows what? Two men. He just literally took two people he could draw and says, go. That's what he did. Now, when our ministry started in the U.S., many of us probably would not know, but that's how it started. The G.S. just literally called two people and said, go. I was in the early 80s. That's how Deeper Life came to the U.S. Of course, there are students who have been here, who came from Nigeria, who are, you know, who are individuals, who came to school, and they were interested, they were beginning to have a little bit of fellowship here and there, but there was no church. So basically, he just literally, and I happen to know the story a little bit of how they were even chosen, but that's not uh, the subject of our discussion tonight. But I'm just saying, in essence, it gets to a point where if you are going to ask somebody to go and do something, you have to trust them that they're going to carry it out. So what would you find here in case of, of, of uh, Joshua that is different from Moses was rather than call a group and say, just give me one man, it is the group that is giving you their trusted man, but their trusted man may not be somebody that you can trust. That's the difference. So Joshua, now being the leader now, just chose two men and sent them out secretly. And he gave them an assignment. Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went. That's it. And here is one thing you could have expect also. This is part of the reason why you have to trust people to send them on an assignment. Here, what could have happened was they already had a very bad precedent, right? They already sent the uh, sent twelve, right? And those twelve already came back and they discouraged the people except with the two. But now that he was sending two, out, what you could have discovered was they could have responded and say, "When we went first, this is what the other people discover." So now, why are you sending us again? When we already had the report, that's part of the thing you learn, that the new people that were sent didn't have to question Joshua on the essence of him sending them. They just went. They didn't have to make reference to the 12 spies. They just went. Because the assignment is very simple. Go there, spy the land, come back, and let us, and let us know. And they went, and then they came into the house of 
of an Anahalot's house, named Rehab, and lodged there. Now, I'll come back to that quickly, but let me read verse 2. And he was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. I'd like to put those two verses together. Amen? In verse 1, the good people set out his fire, right? In verse 2, well, if you permit me to say the bad people, right? They also had their own spies. Do you love the lesson there? The spies are on both sides. The devil has his own spies. That is spying out people every day. Look, there are spies spying out your family every day. You better know that. Every day, they are checking. Are they doing what is right? Are they doing what is good? Are they, you know... They are looking for a crack in the wall. And as soon as they get the crack, they, they swoop in. They want to start doing their evil work. And the same way in a church, there are spies that are coming in every time. It's not everybody who dress. Some will even dress exactly like us and look good. Because many a times we are deceived by look, right? He dressed like us, he wears shoes like us, he would put hat and he's all covered. All those things can just be cosmetic. Then we can always put people in a cosmetic looking good just to get what he want. So now the question is, how now should we react? How do we discover if people are genuine or not? That's what the process of training and watchfulness, uh, that's what he, he demands. Number one, you want to be sure that when people come in, just because they are wearing what you wear does not mean you throw them in. Okay? Oh, yeah, he's just, he's part of us. You know, he doesn't uh, do this, he doesn't wear this, he's uh, wearing this and he's wearing that. And on that basis, you want to throw somebody in, you may just be throwing in his spot. You may just be throwing in his spot. And in the world, it's not just here, you know, in the world, it happens too. Uh... If America wants to penetrate any place, all they needed to do, if they want to penetrate any company, all they needed was to just find somebody who would know that business and send him there. Now, they can send a big engineer to go and do a dirty job of uh, uh, shoveling the road or cleaning and all of that, because you know what? The man's salary is not based on what he's doing there. The man's salary is based on where he was coming from. But he can go low and do whatever work he's been given. So we have to realize that we also, God has set us up in a place like this to be watchful. To not just uh, pretend like, well, whoever wants to come in and go, that's okay. Well, yes, the church is open to everybody, but the work, working group of the church is not open to everybody. It's not. Everybody is allowed to come to church, but even while they come, our eyes are open. Amen. Our eyes have to be open. And everyone has to be engaged because I'm surprised that these people came in one day and by the evening the king knew. It wasn't, it wasn't like, like they came and they were been living there for months, no. It's just like right there and then that day he came and then right there and then the king knew that they came. He says, these people came today. Show us where they are. Show us where they are. But again, thank God too that the spies too, they were very watchful even when they got to the place. Because somewhere along the way, they got to know also, right, that the king was coming. Because he didn't meet them. If they didn't know, he wouldn't have hid them. Right? So, there was a free flow of information. And as we live in the society, brethren, there will be free flow of information. Both useful and not useful. So, how do we make use of those information? to the benefit of the kingdom, and to the benefit of our own life. That's very important. So it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in Hida tonight. They just came tonight, and already they went to tell the king of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent out, sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which shall enter into thy house. For they become to search out all the land. Now you see the haste with which the king acted. There was no delay. 
Again, you know, brethren, sometimes when we read the Bible, we may not, some of these things we may not really, we may just read and pass over them and we are gone. But really, as leaders, you have to examine this thing and say, okay, look at how they reacted and responded to this thing. We have to respond quickly. How do we respond to information? If new people come into our midst, how do we respond to them? Do we respond in a way that we want to catch them quickly before someone else catch them? Because as you are making effort to get them into the kingdom, the devil is making effort to want to get them into the kingdom. So how do we respond? We have to respond quickly. Well, another question you have is, we go back to the issue of Rahab now. Question would be, why did they go to the house of Rahab? Why? Why did they go to the house of Rahab? Number one, I think the most important thing is for you to understand that, number one, they are being led by God. That's the most important thing to know. Being led by God. Because in this assignment, this is not an assignment you do and you depend on self. This is an assignment where you are going and you depend on God. Or God already gave them, I mean, number one, they knew that their leader sent them. Number two, they knew that this was God's assignment. Number three, they understood that when they go on God's assignment, they will be led. And Israel, Israel likes to understand that, you know, any assignment they are going to do, God is always there with them. So, obviously, there has to be a measure by which they understood you know, that they are supposed to go there, and so they went. So we have to assume that, that they were led by God. Otherwise, they should have gone somewhere else. But one thing you have to realize is the peculiarity of Rahab. Amen? Rahab was living in a part of the town where there was a lot of traffic. A lot of people were coming in and going out. Rahab was living in a very strategic place on the wall where you can see those who are going in and coming out. So, Rahab was like the eye of Jericho. Was like the eye of the town. So, the question is, if you are going to a place, how do you get information about a place? It has to be somebody like Rahab. Yes, Rahab may be a woman of questionable character. Yes, Rahab may be personal non grata. Yes, Rahab may not be your typical... Information officer, but he really has the most important information by, by the nature of her business, I mean, the nature of her personality. So, what do we gain there? Well, if we are going to get information about anywhere, about anything, about any, any group of people, we have to seek out the rehabs and where they are to be able to get the right information. Because if we don't, part of the strategy for church, for church growth is that. If you just stay within your own and that's all you say, you probably will not be able to get much done because you will never be able to reach out to those you need to reach out to. So you have to find a strategic way to reach out to the kind of crowd that you needed to reach out to. And God will help us as we do that in Jesus' name. Amen. So from, from all these uh, few things, I don't want to talk too much about Rahab because we are not studying Rahab, but at least from these few things, we see a couple of things that we need to learn from. Now, as we transition from that tonight, I want to transition to something I really would love to talk to us about, uh, which is basically about, you know, I've been talking about it already, about church growth, growing the church and uh, increasing uh, membership in the church. And since we are leaders, that's what should concern us. So the question is, how do you do that? How do you break loose? How do you break out of, the, of your limited range to becoming something, uh, a group that is greater? Um, one of the researches that has been done shows that there are certain things that keep an organization down. And I want to just look at those things briefly tonight. You know, especially a church. This, this, this research was done in terms of a church. It wasn't done just for any organization, but it was done for a church. What are those things that keep organizing or a church down that will not make, make a church to grow? Certain things have been discovered to be responsible. But before I mention a couple of them, I'll just take like maybe a few of them, three, four, five, six of them, or seven, uh, out of the many. There are so many other things that you may see. But one thing we have to realize is that most churches in America are quite small. Many a times with the concept of churches being mega churches, we think it's every church that is mega. No. Actually, um, mega churches in America are just 2% of the population of churches. They are just 2%. 
In fact, most churches in America are about, I think about between 60 to 70 percent of churches in America are less than 100. About 70 percent. Maximum 70, but at least not less than 60 percent of all the churches in America, and, it, and I'm talking of everywhere and in all denominations, whatever group they may be, most of them are less than 100. 60 to 70 percent are less than 100. So when we are talking of mega churches, I'm talking of churches that are 1,000 up, they are 2 percent. 2 percent. So you will understand that this is a research that has been done over and over, and they've discovered that this problem. Is, is an enduring problem and it takes it takes a lot of planning and strategy to overcome it. So for us as a group, we've been talking about we want to grow, we want to grow. The question is, do you just grow by talking about it? No, it doesn't happen that way. You have to do something about growth. And there, there is a scale, there was a scale that was used for churches. And I, I, I wish I wish I brought it tonight, but I still remember a little bit that there is a character of churches that even some of the characteristics of the church doesn't allow them to grow because of the way they, they, they operate. Generally, the churches be below 100. One of the reasons why they don't grow beyond 100 is because the only person that is in charge of the church is the pastor and nobody else. And so generally, in fact, even up to the church of 200 members, it's still the same situation. The, the pastor does everything, including visitation, naming, or whatever, everything that needs to be done there. So at the end of the day, he really doesn't have time to do anything else. So churches below 200, that's one of their greatest problems. Then church, they call that, they call that the pastoral church. Then, from 200 to about 300, uh, they call that the process church. Process churches are churches where they have been able to structure themselves in a way that they can do things, but there are still some structure that are missing. But in a way, they began to develop structure and strategy around what they do. Now, when you see a church from about 400 and, and uh, up to about 600, those churches are actually breaking out of just a process. They have become, you know, something that they are really, really, uh, they, are, they, are, they have perfected their structure. So you can call them more like a perfected church in the way that their systems are more perfected and things run smoothly. Because think about it, 400 people is quite a number. So if you don't have a good um, regulation around things, it's not going to work. It's quite a number. And then when you get to the churches that are thou, a thousand uh, members of, oh, actually, most of the time, it's easier. Research shows that it's easier to grow more when you get to 1,000 than to grow when you are in 100. It's much easier to grow from one, at 1,000 than to grow from 100. Because you know what? It's not just the number of people that are, that, that are more serious in the organization that are available. But because the process is so refined, things just they, you know, things are moving. And there are a whole lot of number of people that are available to do things. So, you know, that's the kind of mindset. And for you as a leader, as a worker in the church, you need to understand this: that there are certain things that will keep us down unless we take care of them. So let me talk about some of those things tonight, and uh, we're just going to pray about them, trusting that the Lord uh, uh, will give us grace. So we are within the 200 range. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to just bring a couple of things uh, that may be a challenge. But before we do that, let's read, uh, let's read Exodus 18. Exodus 18. This is uh, an area you know very well. Exodus 18. From uh, verse Exodus 18. This was after they came out of Egypt and they are now in the wilderness. And they were beginning to move. And then Jethro visited at that time. Too much books. Exodus 18. We can start from verse 13, I believe. 
And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood by Moses from, mo from the morning until evening, unto the evening. And when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did to the people, he said, What is this thing that thou doest to the people? Why stand thou thyself alone? And all the people stand by thee from morning unto evening. And Moses said unto his father-in-law, Because the people come unto me to inquire of God. When they have a matter, they come unto me, and I judge between one and another, and I do make them know the statutes of God and his law. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and these people, and that uh, uh, that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to God word, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God, and thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and play such over them, to be rulers of thousands, and rulers of hundreds, and rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all seasons, and it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the body with thee. If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all these people shall go to their place in peace. So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law, and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel, and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of tens, and they judged the people at all seasons. Uh, they had causes they brought unto Moses, but every small matter they judged themselves. So, you see from that point, some very important things there. If you go back to the first verse that I read, verse 13, it came to pass on the morrow that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood by Moses from morning unto evening. You see that? So Moses was compared with serving. He was busy just walking and walking and walking. And there are other things he could have been doing. But because he wanted to make sure that people are well served, he kept on serving them. Uh, many of us who have been in the Bible study, you probably, I think the last Bible study, the, uh, the GSA said something that I think relates to this. Uh, in those early days, after service, the GS would be there on Sunday and people will line up and you know, the man will cancel from immediately after service deal, sometimes 7 p.m. In fact, I've seen situations when, even not too long ago, when GS came to the U.S., after he finished the revival with us, he was there so late. In fact, he was the one that literally had to cry him out to go and eat. And the man had not eaten since morning, and it was almost like 5, 6 in the evening. So he had to literally drag him out. The wife had to literally say, no, no more canceling. This man needs to go and eat. And you know, sometimes we as leaders, we think, that's great, you know. Uh, the people need canceling. I must be there. No, you are just wearing yourself out. It's not the proper way. Okay? It's not that, and you know, if you, again, listen to what the GSS said uh, in the last episode. He said, I almost feel like most of the canceling I need is useless. He says, it's a waste of my time. Is it because, you know, at the end of the day, he said that in this last Bible study that he gave us last Wednesday, he said, you know, because some of the things people are asking you about, some, some of them, they should go and ask somebody else. Because that's not the thing that you as the leader should be way, one wasting your time on, right? Uh, I can't eat. So how do I eat now? What is, what is, the, what is the problem of the leader which you can't eat? You can't eat now, find a way to eat. Oh, uh, you know, I have not been sleeping for some, some days. So, that, you know, those, those are not serious issues, really. Of course, you need prayer, let nobody pray with you, but some people can keep you one hour telling you that story of how uh, heaven and earth mix together and night and day came together and, you know, somebody ran and somebody walked and they'll tell you all those long stories. And all they did was just waste your time. But now, Think about all the programs that the GS is doing now. Do you think he can actually sit down the whole day, listen to somebody, and then do revival every weekend? No. No. You can't. There's so much to do in the ministry that 
You cannot keep on doing, I just listen to one person. In fact, spending almost two, three hours with one person is a lot of time. It's a lot of time. So, Moses' father-in-law saw what he was doing and he said, there is no way, and you are talking of me, about three million people. So from money to living, people are lined up. And at the end of the day, he may not even do half of them. He may not do half of them. And then next day, there are more people coming. Next day, there are more people. But is it the only one who can cancel people in areas of life? No. There are other people there who can cancel. Joshua was within there. He could have taken some people. Other people who are faithful in the congregation could take some other people. They could do that. But because everybody wants to see the leader, then the leader sit down and then he spend time. And at the end of the day, you know, the, the consequence of that is that the whole fellowship will not advance. Even though you may solve one man's problem, but the whole group will not advance. Because there are other things the leader needs to plan to be able to advance the course of the whole group not just the cost of one man. So at the end of the day, what you are going to do actually is you spend so much time taking care of one individual. And you know what? In our typical African churches, we love that. Sincerely, we love that. Ah, the pastor, you know, he has time for everybody. Yes, he should. And there's nothing wrong with that. If there are serious cases you need to attend to, he should. But he shouldn't have to, you know, because in the typical African church, the pastor will have to visit everybody's house. And if he doesn't, then he becomes like he has not done right, right? But listen, if a man has to do that to all, let's even say you have 100 members. And you have to visit them every month, every, everybody, every month. How many times do you have to even pray? How many times do you have to, to actually, because you are going to be driving around, and you are going to be looking for their convenient time when they are going to be available. It's not your convenient time they are going to be coming. They are going to be finding their convenient time. And the convenient time will be the time you should be doing something more profitable for the for the whole group. So, what I'm saying, in essence, is as you see it, the scripture is still happening. And when this research was done, that's what also they discovered. And I'm going to, going to just read some of the discovery to you so that you will understand. And it will help us as a group to know that there are certain things uh, we also need to do. And the Lord will help us to put them in place in Jesus' name. So, here are the eight reasons Churches who want to grow end up staying small. That's, that's the way it's put. That's, that's the way the research is put. It says reasons, about seven or eight reasons. I'm just going to mention some of them. Uh, number one is the pastor is the primary caregiver. That's number one. Every, all the time. He is the primary caregiver. And then I'm going to read the comment. It says, honestly, if you just push the, past this one issue, you will have made a ton of progress. When the pastor has to visit every sick person, do every wedding, funeral, and make red, you know, it's so funny. As small as we are, there are many people when I say, uh, Pastor, so and so will be the one who will do it. They say, Oh, but Pastor, you could have done that. I said, If I keep doing wedding and keep doing these and keep doing, I'll never do anything else. There are other pastors in the church. But you know, as leaders, we need to understand that. That one man cannot keep doing the same thing. That's why I just got to the point. I said, name me and this and that I'm not doing anymore. I don't care who said it. I'm not going to do it. There are other pastors in the church. They should let them do. Let them also use their own time and, you know, take care of these things. Because if you keep doing that, there are people who prefer one person against the other, right? I don't care about that so much. Whoever is the pastor of the location will take care of it. If people don't want that done, then they may just avoid it because nobody will say you must do name anyway. So if you want it done, then you do it according to, the, to, the, to whatever we want to do in the church. So it says if you push, push past this one thing, you will be fine. The church will probably be much fine. So that you are not doing, you know, you are not making regular house calls, doing wedding, doing funeral, you know, visiting every sick person, and then you will become incapable of doing other things. He said, that model doesn't scale, just doesn't scale. If you are good at it, look at it, look at how they put it. If you are good at it, you will grow the church to 200 people and then disappoint people when you can't get to every event anymore. Or you will just burn out. It creates false expectation and so many people get hurt in the process. Although it's 20 years, this is one person now giving his own experience. He said, although he has been passport for 20 years, he says, this is still the way I felt. Then number two, 
they went on to say the leaders lack strategy. Now, that's another major problem, the leaders. That when you go from just the pastor, then you go to the leadership. Not just, when he says the leaders, you know that he's not talking about one person. He's talking about a group. A group. So the group of leaders, or those who are leaders, as all of us who are here tonight, we are the leaders. He said, many churches today, they are clear on mission and vision. What most lack is a widely shared and agreed upon strategy. You have the strategy, but do you agree on it? And then how are you carrying it out? So for example, for us here, this model that is in the church, we, we already know it. The church already, we already have house fellowship structure, we already have Zuna structure, but are we really making use of it? That's a strategy that our, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's already there, the church already has it, and it's already there, but are we making use of it? Because if you don't make use of what you have, then why are you looking for a new strategy? Because we can sit down here and brainstorm over and over, but what you find out, and Americans are find out over and over that, when you have the, the cell church, it works there. When you have the small group, it works there. One man can take care of about five or ten people, it's much easier. But when the group beyond that group is too much for him, he cannot get to all of them. So the question there is that the house fellowship structure becomes very, very important. That's why for us as a church, it made us to grow very quickly. When, when Deeper Life started, the house fellowship structure made us to grow. But in the West, it's like we are resisting it with every ounce of our life. We are saying no house fellowship. We can't do it. The problem is that if you don't have a house fellowship structure, you are going to leave some people behind. Amen? You will leave people behind because, you know, everybody in the church will expect that the pastor will reach in. But unfortunately, when you get to that number where you cannot reach everybody, you will disappoint people. Now, how do you take care of people now so that they don't get disappointed? It's at the house fellowship level. Where, if you are a house fellowship leader and you have only five, between five and ten people in your house fellowship, you are able to reach them, and then they don't feel like they are neglected. That if they have needs, they can bring it in. And then, the whole church-wide, the leadership in the church can now address those needs and be able to take care of it. But we seem to have struggled so much with our own structure. So, I think, if we really want to grow, we need to return to the structure that is given to us. We need to pray that God will help us to be faithful to that structure. Because over there in Africa, they are still using it and it's still working. And many churches in America are even beginning to use it. Some of them, you know, they are, they are even doing satellite services. That people are not actually coming to a larger place. They just stay in small, small places and they are listening to the same messages. And they are growing. And they are excited about it. So for us as a group, we need to understand that God has given, you know, one of the things that I think is the greatest challenge of us Africans that are discovered is that we don't value our own things. Sincerely. Other people value what we have, but we don't. We don't. And that's a big challenge for us. Uh, somebody did a research about, I uh, was just yesterday I was discussing this, somebody did a research about the kind of books that are being read in the Christian churches in Africa. Do you know the books they are reading? One of the most popular ones is the man I showed you yesterday. You know, one of our brothers here said his book is so popular in South Africa. But you know what? They did the research and they said they want to see if any of these big, big African leaders are people reading their books. Do you know why? Rather than us even thanking God for the ones God has given us to us, we just near at them. Yeah. We had to mention this man from social church. Hey, big. We don't even know how he got to. What is your problem with that? But unfortunately, the people we are sending money across to buy their books, they are in more error than the ones we are injecting over there. Unfortunately. So if you don't value what you have, you will get the wrong thing and you need to value the wrong things. And God has given us great, great people that can be good models. It's not just one of them, several of them that God is using in Africa. That it can be very, very useful to the cause of the gospel. 
but we don't take them serious. And so we also come here, and that's why we come here with the disaster mentality. Now our method that we've been using that has been working, we don't take it serious. But you know, funny enough, some Africans are actually, I mean, some Americans are living here to go over there to study our method. And come back and say, oh, the reason why they are going over there is because they are doing the house, house church method. But we are saying, we don't think it will work. May God help us. So, brethren, what I'm doing tonight is to provoke your mind. Not to condemn in any way, but to say, we already have the method. We don't have to sit down here and look for strategy or method. Really. Because if we sit down here and try and do it, we'll just, it's just an exercise in utility. We already have the method. Make use of it. Make use of it. It's, it's not, and it's not difficult. Because, listen, in the early days, one of the reasons why we get people to church is because they first started in the house fellowship. It's easier for people, you know, at the beginning, you may not see them in church. But after a while that people have come to your fellowship, it's easy for you to tell them to let us start church. Do you actually see that that's how even the GS itself started? They actually started with a Bible study, and for 10 years there was no church. Or oh, about nine years I've been the baby. Because we started 73, we just started in 82, right? So for almost a space of nine years, there was really no choice. It was just the Bible story. So you grow yourself to the point where you start, you have a good critical mass. And so when we start again, and we start breaking into the house fellowship, because very easy, because in that house fellowship, people take care of themselves, and they grow there, they become stronger there, and then you can use that place to now introduce church to them. But many a time we think, if I just get somebody and drag him to a church, that's the easier way. They may come once or twice, they may not show up again. But if they have a commitment to the house fellowship and they know what they are learning there and they love it, it's easy for you to now say, you know, church. And we gain more people through that method than through just directly bringing people in. So let's consider these brethren and revive our house fellowship method. And, I, you know, as I spoke with uh, our pastor, the local pastor here, one of the challenges that I think we have is that we are not saying people can commit to lead the house of mission. Because, again, if those of us who are leaders here, there's none of us here who should not be able to lead one house or the other. So if we are not able to do that, then how do we get the house of mission going? Of course, that tells you people can't even come to simple workers' meetings. Asking them to leave the house will just be a challenge. But if we truly are committed to growing this church, we have to return to the proven method that has caused us to grow. And the Lord will help us. So two things I've said now. Number one, you know, don't allow your pastor to become the primary caregiver. Share the vision and let everybody know. Number two, strategy. Well, number three, I've almost talked about it. Number three just simply says, the true leaders, they are not leading. That's another thing that was discovered, that is causing churches not to grow. That will cause a church that is about 200 not to move beyond that. Or a church that is 100 cannot move beyond 200, or 200 cannot not move into 400 or higher level. It's because those who, are, who truly are leaders, they are not leading. They prefer to just take the back bench. And when those who are supposed to lead are not leading, then obviously the followers are not going to come and lead. So that means everybody in the group becomes sitters. They just sit and warm the bench. So again, what that means is that if we truly want the church to grow, then we need to uh, put ourselves in. One, one of the challenges also, you know, as part of that issue of leaders not leading is the fact that uh, sometimes you ask somebody to do something and he's not doing it and you leave them there. That's, that's part of the concept of true leaders not leading. And then those who can actually do it, they are not stepping up to do it because somebody else is there. So they said, you know, since somebody is in charge of that place, I, you know, I don't want to, how do they put it, rough the boat, right? Or rock the boat. So I'm just going to leave it. So where you have that situation happening, it becomes a real challenge. But I think what we need to do is to look at those who have a track record of being responsible and, and faithful 
and just let them do the work. And I just say, oh, I've been here for so, so, so long, I have to continue to hold that. No. If somebody has been doing something and is no longer being effective, you know, they should just simply be moved on the side and allow somebody else to do it. Otherwise, stagnation. Number four is the issue of people not having initiative and feeling like they need permission to do actually everything. If all of us feel like we need permission to do everything, nobody will do nothing. Because everybody's work is what? Nobody's work. So, if everybody feels like, you know, you are going through here, and everywhere is all dirty and everything, and you think, and somebody feels, well, before I can even clean here, we don't know those who are in charge of cleaning, so maybe we need to get permission from them. <laughs> that job will never get done. Or, you know, look at them, they are too, and uh, uh, we need to cook food and get it ready for every one of us. Hey, maybe there's somebody in charge of kitchen. And let me go and get permission from us, maybe I need to join. Really? Do we really have to get permission from people to do something like right? No, brethren, no. That kills, that kills initiative, that kills people's, you know, skill. And I don't think there's anybody who ever said that anybody needs permission to do anything. But I think it's just a rule that we erect to hinder us from doing things. So what they discovered was that when you have a church full of people who think they need permission or they have to be specially instructed to do things, then you find out that that church doesn't move on because most people just sit down and they don't do anything. And there are things to be done. And they don't do it. Not because they cannot do it, but because they thought, well, I have not been told to do it. So nobody is taking initiative. Nobody is looking at what needs to be done and doing it. You know, many a times we will have to announce after like a meeting and say, oh, there's clean to be done, please wait and do it. Here is what I find out now, I, you know, I'm just going to say the way it is. Some of us, even after still being told, we still don't do it. Some of us can even sit down here while others are cleaning. Some of us will find something else to disturb us. You will find you will be busy doing something, one thing or the other, just so that you will not be part of that thing. Or they said uh, it is uh, the east district that is going to clean this Sunday, and you are from the east, and you just don't care. Some because of that they rather just take their things and leave. So if you even after you are giving permission, you don't do it, then obviously the one that you will need permission to do, you will not even do. Or you expect permission to be given, you will not do. So, think of all of these. If for any reason we are not growing as we should, it is because of these things. The leader becomes the primary caregiver. And then the, the team of uh, workers and leaders, they lack strategy. You know, the, the, the mission is clear, but nobody is carrying it out. And then the true leaders, they are not leading. They are taking a back bench. And then everybody is looking for permission to be able to get to do the work. And about that one, this one is very funny. He says, one of the things that causes churches not to grow is that the pastor suffers from a desire to please everybody. He just wants to please everybody. And let me put it this way, it's not just the pastor, it's, it's probably maybe you say the leadership suffers from a desire to please everybody. Brother, we are going to offend people. That's part of leading. When you lead people, you will offend people. Because if your friend is supposed to be part of those who will assist in doing something and, he, and he's sitting down and he's not doing it, if you, don't, if you don't tell your friend that we are supposed to do this, come and join because you don't want to offend your friend, then you are going to end up doing the work you know. And actually, you're going to spend more time doing it. If that is supposed to cost one hour or 30 minutes, you are going to spend double the time because you are the only one doing it. Because your friend don't want to join, and so you don't have the courage to say, come and do it. So many a times, even when they say, let's go and do something, and you know this person is supposed to be part of it, and they are just roaming around and chasing after the little children and doing nothing, you know, at the end of the day, you are going to end up doing it. So, 
I think the way to get out of that is for us to develop courage to say, if there are two or three or four of us who are supposed to do that thing, we are all really, if they are not coming, we are trying to get them to come. That's the answer to that. It's very simple. Amen? The Lord will help us. Again, brethren, like I said, this is not to condemn anyone, but you have to, when you lead people, you have to be able to discover what is the challenge. Number six, willingness to let others take the credit. Does that sound like what, what we know? You know, it's like somebody will say, you know, if this thing is going smoothly now, if somebody else is going to do what? Take the credit. So if I do it and everything go well, so and so, the glory is going to be for so and so. And for that, they don't want to do anything. And in a very small church, that's, that's big. That's big. If that, if that spirit were big, that's very, very big. So, people will be doing less and less and less because they said we're all, or people will be doing only the things where they are recognized, where they, they, are, they are giving credit. And then they will, do, they, will, they will not show up in places where they are not giving credit because they don't want others to take credit. Maybe in the section, uh, let's put the youth section as an example, because we also work with them in the youth section. And, you know, things are really going well. And it started going well because you are contributing. And then you start feeling, well, if they think go well now, you know, the, the youth leader will be the one who gets the glory. Or maybe in the choir. If we sing very well this Sunday and our, our organization was so, you know, we sang and everything was all coordinated, where it's only the choir uh, master or choir leader that is going to get the glory. So for that reason, uh, somebody said, well, you know, practice or anything, I mean, you know, if we do practice, I'm not going to put my best into it. Uh, if we leave this place and they ask us to go home and practice over again, I will not. So you don't put all the best, the seriousness that you want into it. But I think the solution to that is that you have to realize that God rewards us on the basis of our own faithfulness, not on the basis of other people's faithfulness. Amen? Amen. Every one of us, we are going to receive what we have done. And Bible says whether it be good, or whether it be bad. So, don't you ever think because you are doing well and everybody sees you doing well, the glory is going to suffer. Well, even if the glory goes to, listen, if the Father is doing well, who, who is everybody? When they say the Father, who is the first person they hear? They remember? Mm-hmm. Pastor Kumui. Pastor Kumui, that's it. Everywhere you go, all over the world. When you say the Father, those who know the Father, it's, only, it's the only one. Look at the Bible, it's the same way. When you talk about all the children of Israel, who led them out of Egypt? Moses. Moses. <laughs> Before you ever talk about even Joshua. Even when we talk about Joshua, we still say he followed Moses' pattern. Everything is going back to Moses. Yes, sometimes a man may take glory because that's how he's set up. But that doesn't mean that people like Joshua, God didn't recognize them. Because when it comes to their own time, they give them the opportunity. Think of Caleb. Caleb was there, right? Caleb would have struggled, you know, when they made Joshua the leader. He would have struggled. They, they were the two faithful ones. But you never had the war. The only time you ever had anything from, you, from Caleb was when he said, There are some things that belong to me and I've not received it. Give me permission and give me a blessing to go and get it. And he was asking for his spear. Because Joshua was his spear. They were on the same rank. So, what I'm saying in essence is that it's not about one person getting glory. You have your own glory. There's the glory of the sun, the Bible says, and the glory of the moon. You know, everyone, the stars have their own glory. You can't say the star is too small, but they do their own work. The moon has its own glory. There's, the sun during the day has its own glory. Everyone has its own glory. So, the glory of one does not overshadow the other. The fact that the moon is out there does not make you not to see the stars. Right? The moon is there and it's big. And gives light to the whole world at night. But the stars are shining differently. And you can count them one after the other. They have their own glory. So we all have our own glory. You know, one, one beautiful example is the, is the ministry of uh, Billy Graham. You see all those uh, old people? Uh, you know, sometimes I forget their name. George Beverly Shea. Uh, I don't remember the other guy. Yeah, Cliff Barrow, my, my very good friend. Cliff Barrow. I love that man. 
all those wonderful voices. But you know, it was like these people totally surrendered their whole career and life to this man. But you know what? At the end of the day, you still know that they shine in their own way. Okay? There is no, you know, until any of them, in fact, Billy Graham would not love to preach without one of those people singing for him. He so believed in the administration that he wanted them to go first and prepare the ground before he minister. Now, you think when Billy gets to heaven and is getting glory, God is going to forget the joy Beverly shape? No. Praise God. In as much as he didn't die in sin and he, go, he, he went to heaven, they are going to get their glory there because whatever number of people came to the Lord through that ministry, they, they take part of the glory because they contributed. Brothers and sisters, even in the church, if all you do is just clean the bathroom. And lately, can I say this? Brothers and sisters who have been cleaning the bathroom, God bless you all. Did you hear what I said? God bless you all. Amen. Some days I just go to our, the two bathrooms. I don't get to, to go there during service time, but on the days when there's no service, I just want to be sure that, you know, because sometimes we have this mistake of any of the pipe running and the water is running. So sometimes a whole month, it has run, and we wouldn't know. And I don't want that to happen anymore. So sometimes once a week, I just run through all of the year, I just go around. And those bathrooms smell nice. Smell good. And I say, if anybody comes in here and you get to a bathroom, they love it. One of the places where you can disqualify yourself is a bathroom in an organization. People go there and everything is so early. Nobody wants to even use your commode. I mean, have you ever gone to a McDonald's bathroom? Yeah, that's horrible. It's horrible, or you know, or any of those uh, fast food. It's terrible. But I said, even with the number of people passing through here, our brethren are taking time. And I take note of that. Now, if I didn't say it, you would think, Pastor, did you know the work we are doing, right? I do. And I pray for you every day. That God will bless you. That God will reward your faithfulness. I know there are some who think that's a small job, let me tell you. In the kingdom of God, that's not small. That's a big image for us. That people come here and they see that that area of our facility is always, that's supposed to be the dirtiest place. In fact, it used to be a time when you go in there, water is all over the floor, children throw paper and everything, but now, clean, dry, no papers everywhere, and smells good. I will not forget to say that. It smells good. I don't know where they get those things from, but wherever it's coming from, God bless you all. Amen. It smells good. It's the same way you come to the, you know, I've been talking about some of these carpets, we need to buy vacuum cleaners and maybe wash them. Because, again, in the hallway there, I think the child just take a milk a job and just walk with it all through the hall. And the stain is right there till now. Now, listen, brothers, it may look very small to you, but when you come to an organization, one of the first impressions you have is those things. Those things. You look at it, those things. It has its own effect. So, what am I saying? Yes, one man may seem to be taking glory in those days, but all glory belongs to God. Amen? And he takes glory over them. And God will bless us in Jesus' name. So let's have a heart where we can say, let somebody take glory. That's okay. One man has to take glory, and that's how God set it up. Glory be to God. Amen? And then the last part I'm going to talk about before we pray, because our time really is gone, is the bias towards what is possible. In churches where people don't grow, there is a bias towards impossibility. Do you understand what that means? When people bring ideas, the first bias people have is that can work. That's never going to work. Uh, we've done that before, and uh, we are not sure it's going to work. People just have this negative bias about everything. But you know what? You never know the idea somebody will bring and it will work. And it will work. So, let our mind be in the way we are when people bring ideas as to how we need to move on. We say, let's try it. Because you know what? You never know when you're going to. You may try it before and it may not work. I listened to some advert. I think it was advert about uh, affordable refinance something uh, that the Obama has something did about people refinancing their home. And one of the last lines of the advert says, even if you have tried it before and it didn't really work, a new regulation may make it work for you. Can you believe that we will remember that line in an advert? Yes. That's how much I pay attention to a lot of things. He said, even if it didn't work before, 
or if you are denied before, new regulations will make it that it will work for you. So even if we have tried it before, a new way, a new Z, a new approach will make it that it will do what it will work. Put the house solution thing as an example. Maybe we tried it several times and it didn't work. Well, let's try it once again. Amen? Amen. Let's be organized once again. It's very important. There are just some basic structures of this world that you cannot neglect. House solution is one of them. You neglect it, you kill the major part of the church. We grow through house solution. It's much easier for us to grow through house fellowship, especially when the house fellowship is very effective. When people are devoted to you, when the leaders there do their job, and they, you know, because as the house fellowship leader, you are the pastor of that small group. You know, we are a church where people think you have to be called pastor before you are a pastor. No, when you lead that group, you are a pastor of that. If there are five of them, you are the pastor of those five people. And you don't have to be called pastor before you know that. So, understanding that God expects you to raise those people up in a way, then you do your best. And then, God will do the rest. Amen? Amen. And the Lord will help us. So, please, let's remember those things that I mentioned as we take them to the Lord in prayer. Because I know our time is gone, but maybe next time when we meet, we'll see how we can again revisit them. Number one, the leader being the primary caregiver. Number two, the workers and everybody lacking in strategy and not doing even what the strategy say. Number three, true leaders no, not leading. Number four, uh, everyone looking for permission to do even the simplest things. Number five, um, pastor himself suffering from a desire to please everybody. Number six, willingness to let others take credit. And then number seven, a bias towards what is possible. Shall we take those, those to the Lord in prayer? That where those are fine and meet, the Lord will help us to overcome them. We want our church to grow. Let's rise up. We'll be sitting. We'll be sitting for a while. Rise up, please, uh, so that we can at least be at a large move we'll to sleep. Rise up and just talk to the Lord and say, Lord, please help me. Please assist me. Help me and assist me. Help me and assist me. Lord, we pray for us. We want to grow. Help us to grow, Lord. Wherever all these things are found, oh Lord, take them out. Take them out. Help us to, to take them serious. Help us not to say these are just little things. They are not little. You know, they are not making us grow as we should. So let's pray that the Lord will help us. That all of this is to take them out. Very importantly, the ones that concern you, that of the pastor, I think you know, he can take care of that. We believe that. And the only one who can take care of that is when we all rise up. And then we don't let one man do everything. But we, you know, we rise up and do our own bit so that everything doesn't belong to one man. Especially our members. Who are those who are living around you? What can you do? What can you do to take ownership? You know, last Sunday we talked about owners or customers. What can you do to take ownership of a section of the work so that they belong, become yours? You know, you don't see a group of people in the church. What are you doing to help them, to reach out to them? Maybe they are having a challenge. What can you do? Do you want to reach out to them? I remember one of our sisters, you know, who, 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 who told us about a challenge in one particular place. And that was the only way we could know. Well, which was a good report because if she didn't tell us, we wouldn't know. And by the grace of God, we were able, the church was able to rise up and head and be able to solve that situation. What are we doing to be able to see that all things, see situations like that, it may be very little, but that may be a reason for somebody to just carry their load and be gone. And they may fall into the hands of the wrong person. Let's pray that the Lord will help us. And the Lord will assist us in the name of Jesus. God will help us so that where we can help, you know, we will not hold our hand. We will not say, I'm looking for permission. Somebody must talk to me before I, I, I can do ushering. Somebody must talk to me before, before I can join the cleaning team. You know, any one of us can join. I can join. There's nothing too, too, too low or too high in any job that I cannot join or you cannot join. We can join any section. If I have time, I can join the children and teach them. If I have time, I can be in the new section. If I have time, I can sing. There's nothing wrong with that. Let's pray that God will help us. The Lord will help us to do our utmost in everything. God will help us to put the best feet forward in an attempt to get the work done. Let's pray that God will encourage us that in all the areas where things seem to be falling down, everything, we will be part of those that are lifting it up. Like uh, the, the book of Job, right? This, when men say there's a, a casting down, you and I are saying there's a lifting up. A lifting up. Let's pray. God will make us part of those that are lifting up the standard. Lifting up the standard. What God wants us to do, we are lifting up. We are lifting up. We are helping, we are assisting. Let's pray that God will help us.
Are there little, little things that you can do that you are not doing now? Pray that God will help you to start doing them. To start doing them. To start doing them. It is when you do them that you are going to discover that God will bless you beyond and above yourself. Let's pray for one another. If you see any challenge with anyone anywhere, pray for them. Let's help one another. Let's not think about one man taking glory. All glory belongs to God. For he alone is worthy of our praise. Let no man take all the glory to himself. All glory belongs unto the Lord. So let's not think about one man being glory. Let's think about the glory of God. And when we think about the glory of God, then we do our utmost best. Let's pray. And if there's any area that you have made decisions that you not do this or that, pray that the Lord will help you. Repent of that. You know, many people are partaking their hand. It's like the Bible says that the nobles did not put their, you know, they did not put their head onto the yoke. While everyone was building, the Bible says that the nobles of that land, they, they refused to put their head to the yoke. Pray that we will not be like that. We will not be like those who will not put our head to the yoke. There is work to be done. Let us do it. Let's join, let's join in and do the best. You may not be the head of that group today, but whatever we ask you to do, they do it. Because tomorrow it will become your work. You will become the leader there. Now, when you now lead that section, how do you want others who are supposed to work with you to work? Because in your own time, you didn't work with others. Now you want others to work with you. Remember what goes and what comes, what goes around comes around. Pray that God will help you and help us. Cooperate with the choir leader. Cooperate with the uh, with our pastor when he makes schedules for us. Cooperate with the teachers in the different sections. Cooperate with the youth pastor and the youth leader. Cooperate in the singing ministry. Whatever area you find yourself, maybe it is the cleaning area. Cooperate. Cooperate. Do your best. Do your best and let God do the rest. Leave the rest to God. If there's any area we cannot do by prayer, we are going to trust God to help us. And He will continue to help us. In the name of Jesus. Let's pray that God will help us to break through these barriers so that our church will grow. Our church will grow. And let's commit tomorrow again into the hands of God. Let's pray for our members especially. We want the Lord to, to visit them and bring them. Visit them and bring them. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Remember tomorrow is fall back. Fall back. We're going to lose one hour. So let's pray that God will remind everyone. And that you and I, we will, we will sign up. You know, we have telephone. We can text. You know, maybe we can do that tonight. Text people and say, remember tomorrow. Everyone in your, you know, what if everyone of us here tonight, we text people. Every member that is in your, in your phone. Remember to text everyone and say, remember that tomorrow is fall back. We are losing one hour. That's, that's something that we can all do. It's not difficult. So let's, let's pray tonight that God will help us. That all our members, we will text them and tell them that, you know, they are going to lose one hour. So let's pray that God will make it possible. Make it possible. Make it possible in the name of Jesus. That all of us will participate together to the glory of God. Let's pray that tomorrow's service will be a blessing. First service of the, of the month. The Lord will bless us together. In Jesus' name we pray. Dear Lord, we thank you tonight. We are grateful for the time we have spent here. But Lord, all that we have discussed tonight, we pray. You will assist us to make use of them in Jesus' name. It will not just be a discussion. These are actionable items. That is, items we should act upon. Father, we pray. It will not just be a preaching. This is not a preaching session tonight. We are just discussing with one another as to how we can improve in our ministry. So Lord, help us. That all these actionable items, we will act on them in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we do so, we will see progress in our church. Thank you for the answer. Lord, I pray for each and every of my brothers and the leaders here tonight, and our sisters too, that whatever challenges they may have that have hindered them, Lord, I pray, take those challenges away. Amen. So that they can become effective in the work that you are committed to their hand. Thank you, Father, for the answer. As we go tonight, let your presence go. Over. For Jesus mighty name we are praying. Amen. Amen.